Thank you, Neska. Um, I'm not going to say any dad jokes, all right? I think there's enough of that, and um, Doug is clearly ahead of me, uh, and so is that video. So there's no uh, dad jokes from me. Uh, but when I uh, was reading through that passage, uh, what it made me actually think about was rules. And when I thought about rules, I thought about what sort of parent am I when it comes to the rules? And you're not allowed to talk to Rachel after the service about that, okay? Uh, But I guess the question is, what type of parent are you when it comes to the rules? Are you a stickler for the rules? Do the rules have to be followed strictly? Do you demand a a certain uh, level of behaviour with your children? What sort of person are you with the rules? Or are you a little bit relaxed? Are you almost so relaxed that actually, look, you don't really have any rules? And maybe if there are rules... Maybe your spouse has made those rules up and you don't really follow them. How are you when it comes to rules? Now, I reckon where you place yourself on that scale, I reckon your spouse or children will think differently. So there you go. But when we think about rules, uh, there's been a lot of stuff written by child behaviour experts And what they speak about is actually soft structure and firm structure. And these experts, well, they believe that a child needs firm structure to thrive. And firm structure, well, it can be described like what's on the screen there. Reasonable rules that are consistently enforced, mastery of skills, learning Family values are all part of firm structure. Firm structure not only makes life more secure and predictable for the child, in the long run, it also makes life easier for parents, as many would be, could be, misadventures and crises are avoided. Maybe best of all, Children learn good boundaries and self-care. Now, I don't know what you think about that. I don't know if you think that's true or not, but that's what child behaviour experts think. And really, rules, well, they help us to set up relationships, don't they? And as we look at today's passage from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, it talks actually primarily about relationships. Relationships between children, parents and fathers. It's not so much about rules that you have to obey. It's about a new way to live. They're life principles that help you in your relationships. Now, before we look more at this short passage, it's good to actually understand the context of this passage. Where does this fit? in the book of Ephesians. Well, if you don't know, Ephesians has six chapters, so we're right at the end of the book. And there has been lots and lots of great stuff in the book of Ephesians up until this point. Basically, from chapter 4 and 5 and 6, it actually talks about how we live. How we live under God. Not as a bunch of rules, but again as a relationship. But that's all well and good because to get to this point in Ephesians, it's actually we need to look at Ephesians 1 to 3 because this actually describes to us who God is and how he relates to us. And then the remainder of the book tells us Knowing all that, well, this is how we can relate to others. Now, basically, if you want to know a summary of Ephesians, well, it's got to do with how God has saved us. See, friends, we are saved by grace through trusting in Jesus. 
That's a primary relationship that actually the start of Ephesians talks about. And knowing that we are saved by grace, which actually is a free gift that's given to God, well, it actually allows us to live differently. It allows us to live differently in relationship. And that's the context of our passage today. So how can these four verses encourage us on Father's Day? Well, I actually think these four verses lead to three questions which are up on the screen. What are children to do for their parents? Question one. What are fathers to do for their children? Question two. And what's the most important thing this Father's Day? Question three. So what are children to do for their parents? Well, it's simple, right? It's written there in verse one. Children, obey your parents. Is that all it is? No, because just read a little bit further on and what's the next few words? Well, it says, in the Lord, for this is right. In the Lord, for this is right. And when we think about children in this passage, we can't simply think of a sort of age limit. No, again, it's not just for the preschoolers uh, who have gone to explorers and if you're a parent of a preschooler, you're going to have to tell them when they get home, they need to obey you. No, that's not how it works. See, again, it's more talking about the relationship. So no matter how young or old you are, well, you need to obey your parents. And that's going to look very, very different as you grow, right? Very different. See, it will depend on your life stage how that actually looks. But the important thing is you always keep on honouring your parents. Now, it changes over time. When I was a toddler, when I was in primary school, when I was in high school... I obviously obeyed my parents differently. My father passed away many years ago, so now it's just my mum. But if my mum was to be like she was to me when I was in high school, that would be absolutely weird. And if I was to obey her like I did back then, that would be weird as well. It'd be weird for me, it'd be weird for her, it'd be weird for Rachel, it'd be weird for my, my boys. But then if my mum says, well, come over for Christmas Day lunch and we want the whole family to come over, well, I'm going to obey her, aren't I? I'm going to honour her in that. So, yes, what we do changes over time, but the principle doesn't. And we're probably all children in this room, so we still need to... Obey our parents. But there's more to verse 1, isn't there, than just speaking about children. Because this verse is actually written to people who trust in Jesus. Children are to obey their parents in the Lord. In the Lord because God wants us to act certain ways in our relationships with others. And child-parent relationships will actually look differently if both the children and the parents, well, if they trust in Jesus, compared to just the parent or a child trusting in him. Now, I think actually if both the child and the parents trust in Jesus, that part of verse 2 there, honouring your father and your mother will actually be a little bit easier. But if you're a child and your parent doesn't trust in Jesus, you still need to honour and obey them. And why do you do that? Well, because you want to witness Jesus to them. You want to show Jesus' love to others. So you actually obey and honour them. 
Now, obviously, to a point, if they say, don't trust in Jesus, well, that's a different kettle of fish. But obeying your parents is the right thing to do as a Christian. And then verse 3 adds, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. So obeying your parents in the Lord will benefit you because it's part of God's big picture for your life. See, we know if we constantly disagree and argue with our parents, it actually doesn't help us. It actually leads to further stress in our life. And look, we live in a world that's stressful. Yeah, sure, you can discuss things with your parents. That's a good thing. But we need to remember how God wants us to behave. Obey and honour your parents. And it's not just for the little kids in kids' church. It's for all of us. Now, maybe it's a second question for the day that is the harder one. What are fathers or father-like figures to do for their children? Start of verse 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Now, the word parent could be used here, but given that this verse was written almost 2,000 years ago in a Roman culture that fathers at the time had absolute authority, it's probably addressed directly to fathers. See, fathers back then, well, they could behave in certain ways that is completely unacceptable in today's society. They could force their children of any age to basically become slaves and work really, really hard. They could punish them unjustly for things. That's the culture that this verse is written into. So really, this verse is actually counterculture, countercultural. Yes, children need to have firm structures because it helps their development. But they can't be provoked to anger by their fathers. Fathers can't severely or unfairly discipline them. They can't abuse their authority. They can't constantly nag them. They can't humiliate them or mistreat them. And children, well, children are their own person. See, they have their own rights. They can't be manipulated exploited or crushed. They can't, this can't happen because it's actually against God's loving character. It's against God's loving character. And as we said earlier, this passage is all about relationships. Now, I know not all parents are perfect. Some fathers have provoked their child to anger. I know I've done that. And it's sad. But I also know that we have a God who loves us and shows us what forgiveness is. So if you're a father and you have provoked your child to anger, well, God is actually there to help you. Because he shows us the way that we forgive others. We go to them and we say we're sorry. And we ask them for forgiveness. And that's something you can do when your child is really young or really old. And it's actually really important because it shows to the child an example that you're actually following Jesus, following how God wants us to go to him and constantly ask for, for, for forgiveness. Because, friends, we all do wrong. We've all short, fallen short of God's perfect standard. 
And we need to go to the Lord of the universe often in repentance and ask for forgiveness. So asking your child for forgiveness when you've overstepped the mark is actually what the second part of verse 4 wants us to do. Because in that example, you are bringing your child up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's just one example. See, fathers who trust in Jesus actually have a massive responsibility. And you need to play your part in training and instructing your child in the Lord. Yes, while the church is involved, while your spouse is involved, while family and friends, they can help as well, you have a massive responsibility that you can't defer to others. And you should actually feel the weight of this responsibility. But this weight shouldn't crush you. It should make you turn to the Lord who can help, who can help us fathers live how God wants us to live. See, God has given us his magnificent word. He's given us the Holy Spirit that is called a helper. He's shown us his love with his relationship between him and the Son. He's given us prayer. He's given us a church community. He's given you friends. And he's given you lots and lots of resources that can help you to train and instruct your child in the Lord. Now, practically, this will actually look differently to when your child's younger compared to when they grow older. When they're younger, you can read from children's Bibles, for example. There are so many great children's Bibles out there. I've used the Big Picture Bible, the Jesus Storybook Bible. Kids Church has the International Children's Bible. And there's a contemporary English translation of the Bible as well. All these are fantastic resources to use with your young child to train and instruct them in the Lord. You can also pray with them before they go to bed. You can pray as a family. Another way that you can train and instruct. And as your children get older, well, you can encourage them to grow in their faith and take them to Christian groups where they will grow in their faith. Take them to our youth life group, which meets here on Sunday afternoons. Not today, because it's Father's Day. Next year, the school has given us permission to use this hall on a Friday night so that we can start a youth group here. If you're a father... Take your child and pick up their friends along the way so you can encourage them to grow in their faith in Jesus. Friends, we need to train and instruct our children in the Lord and that is part of a father's big responsibility. To finish today, what's the most important thing for this Father's Day? Well, dads and fathers like figures. Well, we need to be involved in our children's lives. And we also need to recognise that actually men do things differently to women when it comes to raising children. And that is actually okay. That is how God has created it. It's a good thing. See, study after study has shown that fathers are just as essential to the healthy upbringing of children as mothers are. Fatherhood turns out to be a complex and unique phenomenon with huge consequences for the emotional and intellectual growth of a child. 
one study concluded. See, if you're a dad or a dad substitute, you need to understand your unique position and privilege. You need to be there for your children. Your children need you. They need to know your love and care. That was wonderful, wasn't it, the last part of that video? I hadn't seen it before. I didn't know where it was going. But just to see those loving memories or uh, those loving words, it actually sort of brought a tear to my eye. Maybe I was too engrossed in the video and see those other blokes cry. But fathers, isn't it so important just to say to your children that you love them? It's really, really simple, but it means so much. It means so much. And friends, if you look at God's word, well, Jesus says so often, God the Father says so often that he loves us. He loves us so much. And friends, we are meant to do things, as this passage has suggested, in the Lord or of the Lord. We are meant to follow his example. Now, maybe you're a person in the room today who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. And you're thinking, oh, it's all this Christian stuff. What are they actually talking about? Well, can I just encourage you to take time to think about Jesus some more? Can I actually encourage you to do something which may be unnatural for you? Can I encourage you to actually look at another part of the book of Ephesians? And that's Ephesians chapter 2. Because that short passage actually tells us what God has done to us through Jesus. That he saved us. It won't take you very long. Go home maybe this afternoon or tonight. and Just take a look. At Ephesians chapter 2. And if you've got questions, well, email me. I'd love to have more of a, a discussion about it. But if you're a father who trusts in Jesus, that is absolutely fantastic. And you know that God shares a perfect relationship in himself. You know that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are a perfect, loving union and a wonderful example of relationship. Please encourage your children in the Lord. Please encourage your children to trust in Jesus as their King and Saviour. Please encourage them to grow to be more like him. Friends, God is here for all of us. God is with us. God is here to help us, to help us to be parents. No matter if you're a father, father-like figure, grandfather, mother, God is here for us today. Let me pray. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you show your love to us in your son, Jesus. And we thank you so much that through him, you give us an example of perfect relationships. Father, just help us today to have wonderful relationships with our children. Relationships that are firmly established in you. Relationships where we train and instruct our wonderful children in your wonderful son, Jesus. Father God, help us as children to honour and obey our parents. Father God, we thank you that you are with us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for Jesus who died on the cross and rose again. And we just thank you in his name we pray. Amen.